So as, um, as you might see, we're starting a brand new teaching series this morning. And if you are a guest with us, I want you to do this. You ready? Take a deep breath. In, out, and don't worry, we're not asking you for money. Well, at least not today. You know, one of the intimidating factors about church is uh, very often if you're a first-time guest or you go to a new church, it always feels like they're talking about money. And if you're a first-time guest with us, you're like, you're proving me right. Well, it, it's about one series a year, and it's usually around November, because in November we focus on a day that we call Thanksgiving, and why not have an attitude of gratitude throughout the whole month as we, as we think about how we can be generous? Because you don't have to have a lot of money to be generous. Because we can be generous in many ways, right? We can be generous with the way that we have influence, We can be generous with the way that we have compassion. We can be generous in the way that we show kindness. We can be generous in the way that we use our time. We can be generous in the way that we use our natural giftings and abilities, our talents. And yes, we can be generous in the way that we use our treasure. But we're going to talk about generosity throughout this whole series. And I'm going to do my best to answer a question, and it's the the title of this message today, and it's this question. How can we learn to give more fully? How can we learn to give more fully? And by that I mean, how can we learn the art of giving faithfully, gratefully, meaningfully, and dutifully? How can we learn to give faithfully, gratefully, meaningfully, and dutifully? Which is a funny word to say. But as I think about it, these are the topics that we're going to cover throughout this series. How can we give, how to give. So if you expected the pastor to come up and be like, we need more money, we need more money. Every church could use more money, but we need us to understand a couple things before we ever release our purse strings. Because you see, where you spend your wealth is indicative of where your heart is. So if you were to open up your checkbook or or go online and look at your bank account and you were to itemize and see where you spend the majority of your money, you might realize where your heart's at. Some of us, our heart is in our stomach because we see McDonald's come up a whole lot. Cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburger. At least I'm just, I'm preaching to myself. (laughs) Others of us might find that our heart is in entertainment. We've got cable, Netflix, Hulu, Spotify, Apple, the list goes on and on of all the different ways that we pay for entertainment. Others of us, it might be in the clothes we wear, the home we live in. You ever meet a neighbor who says that their home is a money pit? Maybe it's their car or their leisure. Where your heart is, your money will follow. And if our heart is for the house of the Lord, God willing, it will follow as well. So how can we give more fully? Because when we give generously back to God, God can take and multiply the little we give to expand his kingdom. But we also begin to realize that in our own lives, when we operate correctly, the the 10, 10, 80 principle, 10% to God, 10% to savings, 80% to live on, that we will always have enough. But some of us are trying to operate on a 98, one and one. And uh, for some of us, we're realizing it's just not working. So maybe this is not so much 
an encouragement for you to give more to church, but maybe this is more of an encouragement for you to understand how you can give more fully in the moment to being faithful, to being grateful, to being meaningful, to being dutiful that we can give in this capacity. Because we all have something to give, amen? So this morning, I want us to look at this idea. That faithful giving begins with understanding that our God is a generous giving God. Faithful giving begins with understanding that our God is a generous giving God. God is a giver, yes? Hold on, hold on. Let's try this again. God is a giver, yes? Yes. And God loves to give. It's not just something that God does, it's who God is. God is, by character, generous and giving. Now, in my own life, I think about the blessings that God has richly provided for me. I think about the amazing, beautiful bride that God had orchestrated and brought into my life. I think about the fact that by sheer random happenstance, I went to do a favor for a friend and I met Carrie, which then led to the blessings of our two beautiful children, who most days I love and adore, and other days you can have them, (laughs) as they ignore me this morning. I think of the blessing of the family that God had brought me into, Uh, a loving mother, a loving father, a brother whatever pre-qualifier you want to put there. No, my brother and I, we get along great. But there's more blessings than that because as we begin to think about the blessings that God has poured out on our lives, we can think about our callings and our careers, right? For some of us, we had the blessing of being in a career for so many years and we reaped great benefits and it was a blessing that God had richly gave you. You think about the community that God has placed you in, that's a blessing. You live where you live at the time that you live there as a blessing to you to be a blessing to others. You don't live where you live on accident. Think about it. How many of you have had the opportunity to get to know your next door neighbors? How many of you have been a blessing to them? How many of you have prayed for them when they have been hurting? How many of you have brought their trash cans in when they have been sick? How many of you have turned their lights off because they couldn't do it themselves? We've been the blessing to others because you've been positioned there on purpose. All of us can begin to think about the blessings that God has richly and generously given to us because God is a giving God. But if you don't believe me, you're sitting here going, Pastor, if you look at my life, you might see it's a train wreck, it's a mess. God has not richly blessed me with anything. You'd be wrong. Because if we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, we find in verse 27 that God created and crafted your very life. In Genesis 1.27, it says, So God created Adam, man, in his own image, and in the image of God, God created him. Male and female, he created them. You were brought into existence by God. You were given life by God. You are here on purpose because God thought about you before the foundations of the world were even established. He knew all of the days of your life. He knew how many or how little hairs would be upon your head. He knew who you would love, where you would live, what you would do. God knew you, and he created you on purpose. If you are here, you are not an accident. You did not just happen. Lightning did not one day just strike some primordial ooze and out of sheer chaos did order come to everything and by sheer random happenstance are you here. No, you were created and crafted on purpose by God who made you in his image. In the Bible right here, it says that God made us in his image. 
That is the Amago Dei, the image of God. Think about it this way. Anybody like to draw? Any art fans? Man, there's like three of us in the room. I'm like, everybody else just pretend, okay? But maybe, maybe it's good that we don't have a lot because maybe growing up when you would have an assignment in our class, you would have to get this really thin sheet of paper and place it over something else. And what would you have to do? You would have to trace it. And you would do the very best that you could, and you would trace the image, and then you would hold it up, and what would you have? You would have a copy. That word there in the Hebrew gives the idea that you are the carbon copy, as if God took tracing paper and placed it on himself and then drew you. The idea here is that whatever it means to be God, God has given us a portion of that capacity. So think about it. God is a creator God. We are creative. God is a giving God. We can be generous. We have the capacity to be like God because we have been made in God's image and likeness. So again, hear me, you are not here on accident. You are not a mistake. You are not unseen. You are not unwanted. In fact, you are on purpose. You are seen. You are wanted. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it continues this idea of telling us that God has created and crafted us on purpose. Many of us know this passage. It's very famous, and sometimes it's often taken out of context, but let's keep it in context. God is talking to Jeremiah, and he begins to tell him specifically in his day, at his time, that God has plans for him. But we can translate that because not only does God have plans for Jeremiah, as it says here, God says, I know the plans I have for you, my prophet, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope, we can take this promise and apply it to ourselves. Because this was not just a one-off. This wasn't just for one person, as if, Jeremiah, you're the only person who I have plans for. We can see throughout scriptures that God has plans for many people, and that includes you and I. God has plans for us, and he knows the plans that he has for your life. Listen, I don't care if you're 8 or 88. If you still have breath, you still have purpose. For some of us who are older in age, we have the opportunity, and we talked about this last week, to make an influence on somebody else. That as an apprentice of Jesus, you can mentor train, equip, and mobilize, and send forth others by giving what God has given you through experience. So God has good plans for your life, plans to prosper you. If you're still alive, God is still working in your life. He hasn't checked out. He hasn't gone somewhere else. He has not abandoned you and given up on you. God is still very active and present in your life. And God's plans include I want you to see this. It's one of the most important words in the Old Testament. It's the word shalom. That God plans peace. But we've talked about this here since I've been here. That word shalom doesn't just mean like, ah. Because some of us, we like that peace, right? End of the day, and I don't know about you, last night I took my shoes off. I sat on the bed after our dinner and went, ah. It's not just that kind of peace. It's wholeness. It's that feeling you get when you take the last puzzle piece and you put it in and you can see the whole picture. It's that feeling of understanding that you are in natural rhythm with your maker. That the orchestra of life that has been playing is playing the music in rhythm at a pace that you have joined in and you find your part and there is no, uh, what's, what's the word for, uh, it's not out of order, but it's in rhythm. There's that kind of peace of being in rhythm with God. 
See, God has these plans against evil for a future to give you a hope. You know, in the New Testament, it refers to Jesus as a living hope. And when you have Jesus in your life, you have the living presence of hope accessible at every moment. God has this plan for your life. But as it does, there's always a big but in the way. And here's the big but. You can laugh at that. That's funny. That was on purpose. Pastor said, big butt. Yeah, like, listen, I know I'm Nemo. I touched the butt, all right? Uh, if you've never seen the Disney movie, Finding Nemo, they call the boat. Now, we, listen, let's just keep going on. Here's, here's the butt. In Romans 3.23, it tells us that we have a problem. It says that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When you were born into this world, God had created and crafted you with his image on purpose. He gave you purpose for your life, but the world that you were born into is marred by sin. And as a result, that sin is constantly trying to pull you away from God, constantly trying to move you away from the God that has created you because sin's job is to lead to death and separation from God. So as sin has entered into the picture, it tells us here in the scriptures that for who has sinned? For all. Have you ever met a person who has never sinned once in their life? And if you put your hand up, you're a liar, which means you're a sinner. <laughs> One of the big ten. Don't do it. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's problematic because when we sin, what happens is, is sin creates within us a marred image. And because of sin, we cannot stand in the presence of God. God is holy, which means that he is other and separated from sin. There is no sin that can enter into the presence of God. So sin becomes this problem for us, and as individuals who have it in our life, it breaks the relationship that we have with three specific groups of people. Sin breaks relationship between us and God. We see that in the first of the three Ten Commandments. Those are to protect our relationship with God. It breaks relationship between us and ourselves, which is the fourth commandment, honor the Sabbath, be in rhythm. And then it breaks relationship with others, the last six. And what happens is when we have broken relationships, sin begins to corrupt. And the more broken and corrupt we become, the more problematic it is. And God recognized the fact that sin was a reality. And God cared so much about it that God made a plan because Romans 6 23 tells us that if we have sin in our life, sin leads to death. Because the wages of sin is death. But here's an even more beautiful but. But the free, you see that it's free. It doesn't cost you anything because it costs God everything. God is a giving God, a generous God who gave everything for you. But the free gift that God is giving you this morning is eternal life in Christ Jesus, his son. Because Romans 5, 8 tells us that God proves his love for us that yet while we were still sinners, Jesus dies for us. It wasn't when we cleaned ourselves up. It wasn't when we got our act together. It wasn't when we quit doing the thing that we should stop doing. This is one of the problems that sometimes churches are accused of is there's this idea that at the door we don't allow sinners to come in, but the reality is is sinners need to enter into the space to experience the Savior. When sinners enter in, it's the Holy Spirit that confronts and challenges us to grow. We all enter as sinners, and God willing, one day we will all depart as saints. But in the interim, we're called to be sanctified, made more and more into the image and likeness of God. Some of us are further on that journey, but that doesn't give us the right to look down on any of our brothers. We're all walking the path together. 
But when we come in, we recognize that thanks be to God that he died in our place. He sends Jesus so that while we are still sinners, while we are still strangers, while we are still separated, while we are still broken, Jesus dies for us. God proves his love for us by giving his only son, by giving his very best, by giving his all in all, holding nothing back and holding nothing against us. There is no sin or sinner who is too far from the love of God. Because John 3.16 tells us that God is so loved. You see that word right there? It's the word that comes between God and loved. Anybody, what is that word right there? It's so loved. Some of us grew up in a church where God so liked. Others of us grew up in a church where God barely tolerated. There's a theology called worm theology. It's kind of what it's referred to as like, you're nothing more than the scum of the earth. God like was, ugh, whatever. I, you know what? I got to do something with these guys. And there's this theology that makes you seem like you're nothing but the dirt of the earth that just just worthy of being trampled on. That's not what John 3.16 says. It says that God so loved, extravagantly loved, compassionately loved, above and beyond. He so loved the world. And, and, and who's the world? All of you. So like if you turn to your neighbor, they're a part of it. And you turn to your other neighbor who you didn't like as much the first time, they're a part of it. We're all a part of the world. So God so loved all of us. That he freely what? This is what we're talking about. He gives. God so loved the world that he gives. And what does he give? His son Jesus. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but inherit everlasting and eternal life. Man, God so loves you that he gives his son Jesus. He holds nothing back. He gives everything. Later on, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 9 that if we are to confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, then we will find the gift of salvation and we will be saved. That's good news, church. That all of us if our hope and our faith is in the resurrected Son of God, then we can be given a gift this morning. It is the gift of God's salvation. When we trust in God for his salvation, something amazing happens. Paul writes to the church in Corinth these words. He says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, that therefore, and if it's therefore, you always should ask, what is it there for? Therefore, if anyone, going back to the world, going back to everybody, if any one of us, regardless of what our past is, regardless of what sins have been in our life, regardless of the lifestyle we have lived, if anyone confesses with their mouth and believes in their hearts and is brought into Christ, they are therefore a new creation. Your old is gone, the new has come. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. And for some of us, we've stepped into that and we've experienced the new life of being in Christ. The church calls it the new birth or conversion or salvation or pick whatever word you want to use. But if you are in Christ, you are precious and seen, and wanted, and known, and noticed, and loved, and cared for, and given to by God. The old is gone. Some of us, we, we know that even though the old is in the past, it feels like it's chained to our leg. Some of us might know some people who keep defining us by the old, keep bringing us back to our past ways. Hey, you remember you used to do this? Remember you used to do that? Remember you used to live like this? Remember you used to live like that? God says that it is gone. Not only gone, it's passed away and buried in the grave. Where others might 
by your past. God does not. He defines you by your future. He's given you a hope, and his name is Jesus Christ. See, church family, God has given us so very much. He's given us life. He's given us purpose. He has given us family and friends. And more than that, God has given us forgiveness and reconciliation through salvation and new life in Jesus Christ. So God has given to us. So the final question I have for us this morning is this. If God has given us so much, then what does God ask of us? God asks us to be faithful. God asks us to be faithful, to trust him, to love him, to passionately pursue him with all of our life. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a journey. Don't judge anybody else's journey as being better or worse than yours. We all have a unique calling. We all have a unique, unique path before us. But we all have a similar request from God, one of faith. That today we would understand that we are called to give fully to God our faith. We give God our faith by sacrificing a little bit of our time, to be in worship, to be amongst other believers, to study the word, to pray, to fast, to celebrate the disciplines. God calls us to be faithful by sacrificing the talent that God has given us anyway. Your natural abilities and talents come from God, and he wants you to use them for his glory as a blessing to your brothers and sisters around you. And God calls us to be sacrificial with our treasure using the resources that God has given us to faithfully give back to where God is present so that the world might become a better place because of it. So as God has blessed our lives by giving us so much, so very much, God is calling us to trust him, to place our faith within him, and to live our lives for him. So church, this morning, that is our challenge to go forth living and giving more faithfully. Let's pray. Lord, this morning as we come to you, we thank you for the gifts that you have blessed us with. The most beautiful gift that any of us have received is the gift of your son Jesus, who stepped out of heaven into humanity and lived the life that we could not live, a life devoid of sin, a life that was lived perfect, so that Jesus could become the sacrificial lamb, having our sins placed upon him and dying in our stead, that on the cross he knew us by name, he took our sin and our shame, and he died in our place. And if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we believe in our hearts that, God, you have raised him from the dead, then you will give us the gift of salvation. You will save us from our sin. You will reconcile us back into relationship with you so that moving forward, Lord, we might know that we know that we are yours. So for any of us this morning, Lord, who need to understand that we didn't come this morning to give, but we came to receive, Lord, help us to receive the gift of your salvation. Mark us as your own so that when we confess, when we repent, and we believe, we will be redeemed and restored as your beloved children. So, Lord, we give you this day, as we trust, as we believe, we fully give you our faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. This morning... We have an opportunity to come to the table to continue to receive the gifts of God. You know, as Jesus stepped into this world and he gave us himself, there was a particular moment where he met with his disciples and he tangibly demonstrated what it looked like to give sacrificially. 
So this morning, you are invited to the table. The table is open to all. As Methodists, we believe that this is not our table, but this is the table of the Lord. So you are invited. Those of you who love him, who claim him, who earnestly repent of sin and seek to live in peace with one another, you are invited to the table. At the invitation, we come confessing as a community. We confess as a community to the God of mercy and might that there are times where we have not loved God with our whole heart. We confess that there have been times where we have fallen short to be obedient in our life. We confess that we have not always done the will of God. We confess that there are moments we break God's law, we rebel against God's love. We confess that there are moments we do not love our neighbor as ourselves, and we do not listen to the cry of the oppressed. So for this, we come to God this morning and pray. We pray that God would uh, would free us to joyful obedience by the power of his Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. So at this time, may we turn to the Lord in silence as we pray and we confess. So let us turn to God our Father this morning. Our God and Father, may we all hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning, that you prove your love for us, and that while we were still sinners, you gave your son Jesus to die for us. It is in his name that we pray, and we understand that we are, in fact, forgiven. Amen.